one that appeared at the door? What was the bread that they were counting? Can we start it over here? <laughs> are we live yet? I'm sorry. Yes, we are. We are. Okay. All right. So actually, this the this particular episode is booking. What the Lord references in the, at the end of this episode, they're outside the body kept. All right, they're in the field of grain. Pete Simon grabs the grain and starts to eat it. And then the others are just horrified. And it's Andrew that says to him, uh, you're reaping and harvesting and, uh, on the Sabbath. And Simon says, I was just so hungry, I forgot what day it is. And they all look to Jesus and he says, it's okay. You know, so he allows them to eat. And then, of course, the, the Levite comes out. That particular dress that he's wearing, he's not a rabbi. He's a Levite. Okay, he's got the headdress. He's a priest of the Old Testament. Okay, so in, to give you a case in, to, to, to show you the parallel to that, if you look in our church on this southern side, okay, the second and the fourth windows, the second window is Our Lady's presentation in the temple. It's right above the door. Okay, Our Lady's going up the steps. Joachim and Anne are at the bottom of the steps, and at the top of the steps is a priest, a Levite, who's dressed like the man in the episode today. The next window is the angel Gabriel in Nazareth, Our, Our Lady, and then the next window is the marriage of Our Lady with Saint Joseph. And standing behind them is a man dressed the same way. He's a Levite who's performing the marriage ceremony. So the guard tells you he's not a rabbi, he's a priest. He's a priest of the old covenant. Now they, they don't dress like that anymore because the temple doesn't exist anymore. But up until the time that the temple was destroyed, as the practice that they carried from Exodus. Okay, so if we remember in Exodus, the disciples are journeying through the, the desert and God provides food for them every day they receive manna uh, on, on the ground and they're to gather only as much as they need for the day if they gather too much it will sour and it will make them sick they can't get greedy they can't hoard they have to trust that God will provide just what they need every day Except on Friday, on Friday, the sixth day, they are to gather enough for two days because on the Sabbath, they are not to gather the extra bread. So they, they're not to gather bread. So from Friday through the Sabbath, they're supposed to have enough bread. It doesn't sour. It doesn't make them sick. They have enough. And then on the first day of the week, what we call Sunday, the bread appears and they're able to gather it then, okay? When they get to the promised land, as a sign of that, <clears throat> every week they would bake 12 loaves of bread because there are 12 tribes, tribes of Israel. And the, the show bread was kept in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. It was an offering to the Lord. Now the Lord never ate the bread because he's pure spirit. So every week on the Sabbath, they would change the bread. So every Friday, they would bake new bread. They would bring the new bread into the temple to the Holy of Holies, and then the old bread would be consumed by the priests. Okay, and on major feasts, the show bread would be brought out. The, the, the table actually had had uh, uh, poles in it. And so the priests would bring the showbread out to show the people and to remind them of the promise of the, that God had kept and for them to trust in what they call Adonai, the Hebrew for Lord. So, <clears throat> of course, for all of us, and this is, that, this is a different lesson, all of this is an image for us of the Eucharist, the God who gives bread from heaven, and that the showbread, which was in the temple, is, is really the forepromise of what is the Eucharist. And that it is not that it is given to the priests. We are the priestly people in Christ. 
so the food is ours on the on our Sabbath on our day of the Lord, which is Sunday. So at the very yes, it was a little boy named in the tribe. That's correct. So Himelech is the priest. His wife is getting him all dressed because they're going to the bakery and the bread is warm. And so he's counting the breads by naming the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, Levi, um, Judah. Those are the tribes of, of Israel. And then there's a knock at the door and there's a man at the door who is David. And Himelech says to him, oh, don't stay here. And that's what he says to his son, go home now. Tell your mother, you know, to keep you home and be safe because th this is going to be trouble. David's here. Why? Because David has been duly appointed uh, by, by Samuel in Bethlehem, not Bellingham. <laughs> David was anointed by Samuel as the king of Israel. But Saul is still the king. He won't abdicate his throne. So there's this political tension between the two of them. And so that's when he says that he, he knows that there's trouble. And David says, no, I'm here on an errand to the king. No, things aren't well. You and the king are enemies. I know that this is going to be trouble. You know, you're going to, this is going to be a problem. And David says to him, excuse me, we are starving. We have had no food. Well, I don't have anything. Well, you've got bread right here. Give me this bread. This is holy bread. And he says that the rules are the priests may only eat it if they have not lain with their wives so that they are physically pure. He said, can you promise me that your, your soldiers have not lain with women? Yeah, trust me, we haven't done that. <laughs> he says, remember, this is holy food. David says, I understand that. He says, and he says, and, and he says, and this is really prohibited by the law. And David says, but life is more holy than bread. And we are hungry and we will die. So he says, well, it may cost me my life if the king knows I'm giving you this bread. Take it, but don't tell anybody. But of course, it's written into the Bible. We all know the bread. So that's the episode at the very beginning before they roll the credits. And then we see um, the Mary and the bar play knuckleballs yeah. with, uh, <laughs> with the, the, the crew there and, and getting yourself from you, you, you weren't here for the piece of that. But you've seen the episode, right? No. Oh, you haven't seen the episode. Oh, oh well, you're in trouble. I would have been here. I My doctor said, oh, I have uh, to go, I, go early. Well, then you just have to, when you watch the episode tonight, you'll know what it's about. Right? Oh, I can't do that. You can watch anytime you want. Okay. We just can't show it on video because okay. we don't have copyright uh, permission. So, so then, um, um, you've done an awful lot more of that than I did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, again, this is part of what we want to look at is to realize that I mean they're very faithful to the biblical tradition. But if you don't know the tradition of the showbread and the brand of the temple and what the kind of, yeah. you don't understand all the pieces of that. And you don't understand how it's telling you what's going to happen. That's why we need this. Okay. Yeah. So, and that's why when we get to, to the end outside of the Wadi Kelt, it, it's the bookend. It's the same story that Jesus makes reference to just at a different time. And, and, and in the time of his ministry. I keep shaking my phone and it keeps wanting to undo that. I don't want to lose my voice. Um, so, um, so, th so that's all part of the Old Testament, and then it was also part of, in the time of our Lord, that was the practice, okay, the priests went into the Holy of Holies, and so the, the whole point of all of that is that the law says you may do no work on the Sabbath, however, the law made the exception that priests could be able to change the bread, and they also had to function as priests on the Sabbath. So they were given the exception because the people had to worship the Lord. So, excuse me, so they were they were made an exception. Excuse me. So that's part of the point. So you can kind of anticipate that because of this issue about the showbread and David and the bread, we're going to look at the issue of Sabbath. Of course, that's where we're coming from because 
the whole issue before when he healed Jesse is that Simon's brother, who was the paralytic at the Satan, unless you, was because he did it on the Sabbath. So the issue of the Sabbath is this thread that's being pulled through in the different stories of the Gospels. So it's making a reference back to what happened in the last episode with Jesse and his, actually two episodes, with Jesse and his son, uh, and his brother, uh, Simon, and how that converted Simon to abandon the zealot cause and to become a disciple. Um, I remember that was the, the scene last week, they were on the, the waterfront um, when John the Baptist jumps out and spooks them. Uh, and, uh, and he says, why did you do this to my brother? Because I had to get your attention. <laughs> really, well, would you have paid attention to anything else? And then of course, they pulled it through and that we also learn in the course of the story that, that John has been arrested and imprisoned now in prison for life. He's not getting out because we know he's not. They're gonna, uh, Herod's afraid to kill him, but eventually he will find him. There will be a purpose for that as well. Okay, so, um, Um, so then the next episode that we see, it's Our Lady with Rama there out in the field gathering um, berries. <clears throat> and they're talking about the, the it, it's helping us to appreciate that this was not a comfortable lifestyle that they foraged. And so she's trying to explain to them what kind of berries to gather. And they don't know because, of course, Rama is the daughter of a vintner. They, she's had a very comfortable life. Remember, they're the people that brought the wine to the, to, the, to the wedding at Cana. So she's lived a very comfortable life. She's among the nobility, where Our Lady, God bless you, makes the reference to the fact that, well, my son is now a nomad. We, we don't have any income coming into my house either. So, you know, we, we do what we can, what we manage on. And then she makes reference back to when they were uh, on their way into Egypt and how at times they learned in Egypt that they, they managed with what they had and what they didn't have. And, um, you know, that uh, they, you know, they, they did the best they could. And they're also trying to figure out what's happened now to Mary of Magdala. And they don't understand. It's a wonderful kind of take on a modern question. Well, why doesn't Jesus just bring her back? It doesn't work that way. Well, I don't understand. If he fixed her once, he can fix her again. He can just bring her back. Why did he let this happen to her? And our lady says, sometimes he's as much a mystery to me as he is to you. <laughs> and so then she responds, but, but nothing good can come from Mary disappearing like this. And our lady says to her, how do you know that? Well, she could be in a ditch. She could be dead. She could be in. And our lady says, how do you know any of that? That none of that we know. You're creating all of these fears and anxieties with nothing that's legitimate. You don't know that. And then she says to him, some people trust in horses and in their chariots. And Rama says, but we trust in Adonai, in the Lord. We trust in the Lord. So she says, it, you can't change it. You know, why did it happen? We don't know. But it is what it is. And then, of course, we get to the, we're in the bar. Everything's dark. Mary's got a stringy hair. And they're playing knuckleballs, and she's got a bag full of money. And she's the only woman there, but she's running the show. Um, and quite well. And he comments, you know, that uh, a woman should know her place. And that, that, that chimes in Mary's memory. And then it flips. It's hard to realize. It flips at that moment, and she's the child again yeah. with her father. So remember in the opening episodes when they were outside and he had the car mm -hmm. and he was teaching her with the doll. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's to remember that. And that's the first stirring of her conversion. A woman should know her place and Mary realizes this is not her place. Okay. That she has been redeemed and now she's fallen back. So then she gets up and leaves. Then we see Thomas and Andrew counting the lentil beans and Thomas is really worried that they're not going to have enough. But if, well, if Philip doesn't come back and 
Matthew and Simon don't come back, and Mary doesn't come back, and those are four, and then we can have, we can split their portions, and we can have this, and, you know, and of course, because that's the point that they make, right, Thomas is like Matthew, they calculate, they're all mathematicians, and the angel goes, really, like, they, they won't come back, you don't want them to come back just so we can all leave, and if they do come back, what are we going to do, you know, and now he's, because, see, Thomas is, is, a, is another personality like Matthew, He's very practical and very, he needs to plan. Remember, he had the big discussion with Rama about how much wine to yes. bring at Cana, and they had that disagreement as they were loading up the wagon. And then, of course, we're, so we see what's going on in the camp, and Simon's out there doing all his own exercises. <laughs> and then Big John and James are having their discussion about all of the pieces of that. Um, and he comments about, I don't understand why he sent Matthew and Simon together. You know, he said, it's like asking a fox and a fish to team up together. And his brother looks at him and he goes, who would use that kind of analogy? <laughs> Nobody says that. But they also share, which was a, a nice way to play off is that he says, I don't understand this. Sometimes I feel like I'm dead in pieces, but I don't understand this. And then John's the one who responds to that and says, um, it's going to take a long time to understand. Never will. Yeah. Excuse me. And so James says to his brother, for us, you mean? No, no, no. For everybody. And of course, John's the one who will live the longest of the 12 of them, who writes the most, uh, the, the deepest understanding of Christ because he's had the longest time to think about him. And so he's making, it's already an allusion to who John will be in writing part of the New Testament. But it's also a reminder that they were watching this, they were living it, they were experiencing it, and it, it didn't make sense to them. They didn't understand. And sometimes we think, oh, they had it all figured out. But we think, well, I can't figure out my life. Well, they couldn't figure out their life. That's the reality of, of, of having faith and of following the Lord. We just have to be able to trust and to follow uh, in turn because of that. Which one is John in the movie? John is John and James, they were the ones that when Simon was doing his exercises, they were together. John's got almost like a, he, John's the one, John's the one that said the fox and the fish. And James is his brother who said, who says that? Okay, so John's got John's the younger look because he is younger. He has the lighter colored hair, yeah. and James has a very dark beard, a thick beard. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I can't show because the, yeah. their pictures aren't in the poster book that I have because okay. they were different from the first and the second season. One of them is different. Mm -hmm. I think it's James. Um, so then, of course, we see Simon and Matthew. They've been sleeping in the barn, yeah. and um, of course, Simon understands because he does this before and. He wakes up and he says to Matthew, you know, what did you do to yourself? And Matthew looks down and starts to rash because yeah. he obviously slept in some animal's droppings. <laughs> and now, if you remember the very first scene, how he gets so yeah. uptight about yeah. all that, he, said, he throws the shoes away. He yeah. Yeah. Now he's got it on his clothes, um, on his butt, right? And so Simon says, well, did you put that fresh hair? No, I didn't ever do that. Um, you know, when they're going back and forth and, si and Matthew's trying to figure out how he's got a map of the city and he's copying that and trying to figure out what he's trying to do is have a map so that he has one and Simon has one because they're going to divide up. And of course, because Simon, um, excuse me, Matthew lived all alone and nobody, nobody helped him. Everybody hated him. So, you know, he says, well, where's, Simon says, well, where's breakfast? Well, I didn't say it was breakfast. I asked if you were on so, well, I mean, you know, do you know how to cook eggs? I don't know how to cook eggs. So you think it's like, you know, men don't know how to do that. Women do that. Matthew does because he's lived all by himself. So he, at that point, needs to be able to, you know, he says, well, he, so he's not giving up what he's doing. He's working on trying to be able to find Mary and tells him what to do. And you can, while we're making breakfast, you can work with me to devise a plan. So then they, they, um, they have that discussion, and then we see that they they pass one of the soldiers who comes by them, who's drunk and talks about the stairs, and so then they realize that wherever that is is probably where Mary is. 
So then they go looking and they find their way into the bark. Um, and then um, the, uh, the, they're, they're trying to be discreet. Of course, they're not. And they know that they're Hebrews. They don't like them. And so um, Matthew asks about uh, Mary. And of course, it's interesting as he's describing her, you know, he says to Simon, well, how would you describe her? Well, she's got black hair. <laughs> no, she has long black hair. Well, how would you describe her? Well, she's distraught. She's upset. And so you can see Simon looking at her like, really? You're really noticing a lot about her. So Simon's picking up that there's something between uh, Matthew's interest in who Mary is um, in, in the way that that's played out. And then when they get to the bar, Matthew's the one, because he has no filter. He's there, nobody's paying attention. He's not gonna waste time. He's driven, which is part of why the Lord sent him. You know, he speaks up to people. Go, All right, now I need your attention, you know, and I'm looking for a woman. And, you know, it must be, you must be talking about Lilith. No, that's not her name. Well, she just beat me at knuckleballs. And Simon says, we beat me, Harry. That's that girl. <laughs> All right, we found where she was. <laughs> so they leave the bar, and at that point, they try to argue between them who's going where. And of course, Mary's in the corner. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, it's a, a wonderful flip to Matthew. You have to remember how he was ready to retch because he had his, his clothes were soiled, and Mary starts to retch, and he reaches yeah. in with his own yeah. stuff to be able to care for her and sends Simon for water. Mm -hmm. And Simon notices. But when it was on you, you couldn't stand it. Yeah. You put your hands all over her because you're trying to be able to protect her and help her. Again, that's just another level of their, their relationship that they're being put out. But the, the real important thing there is the conversation between Mary and Ben. You know, and the fact of it is that, you know, he already fixed me and I broke again. I can't face him. Uh, I can't go back. And Matthew's the one who speaks up. Matthew's the one who, because of his own person, recognizes who he is. He says, look, Mary, I'm a bad person. No, 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 she says, no, no, no. I lived my whole life for me. It was all about me. I had no faith, no understanding. I didn't care about anybody but me. I'm a bad person, but I'm becoming better because of you. You taught me the Torah, the way that you live. Look at Donald, who's learning to read and write. And then he looks at Simon like, say something, you know, get, you know get, help me here. And he says, remember when we were at the house and you helped those people who wanted to get to Jesus and they went up, you set them up on the roof and they lowered him in, how they met him, knew him. None of that would have happened without you and your care for them and your involvement. You, you've done good things. Don't throw the good away because at one point you were bad and now you're bad again. Excuse me, now we switch to Schmel, who's, who's determined to be able to lock Jesus into breaking the Sabbath. And he and uh, the other guy there, Ash, Shimon, um, who are, um, they're trying to figure out how to be able to do this. And then they have the meeting with um, Shmiel, who is the, the, the Sanhedrin guy. And they're bringing to him the case, and they want to be able to, to deal with the case. Do they want, to, because Jesus has healed on the Sabbath and called himself the Son of Man. This is blasphemy. This is a violation of the law. It needs to be dealt with by the Sanhedrin. And he says, he can't be bothered with this kind of minutia. Minutia? Oh, he just, you see it, he's furious. How dare you dismiss this? This is a big deal because this is their, their, their cause celebrity to make them famous and glorious. And he says, that that's why you still have the lowly job you have. You know, listen, this is not important. And so he gives them an example. He says, there are 631 laws. Yes, but it's not the Sabbath an important law. He says, but, you know, the, 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 he draws the interesting comparison. So in this, you probably got lost in this exchange as well. Because he makes the comment about <clears throat> the need for witnesses. And he says to them, you're, there's only one witness. And you weren't the witness, so your case is very thin because it needs to rest on two witnesses, okay, which is why the fact of who appears at the, at the empty tomb on, in the morning is, on Easter morning is important. Again, but again, women don't count the same way that men count. 
That's not my choice. That's the biblical choice. <laughs> so they make the comment. He makes the comment. If a woman is with her husband and he dies, and she is the only witness, what does that make her? And he says, oh, she's a widow. And, and the, the, the Sanhedrin guy looks at the other and he goes, see, he doesn't get it. And he says, she's not a widow. She's an abandoned woman. Yeah. Because you need two witnesses to verify that he died. There's only one, and she's the only witness. Wow. You need two witnesses for her to be a widow. Otherwise, she's an abandoned woman under the law. And his point to it is, the law has a certain injustice then. So you realize it's setting us up to where we're going to go with, with the episode, that the law has a purpose, but the law has a minutiae that is in times unjust because it can't cover every instance. And so if somebody dies and the only one who sees him is his wife, then it's an unattended death and therefore she, there are no witnesses to his death. She's not a widow, she's an abandoned woman. So therefore her rights under the law are equal. And that's the point he's it's trying so to make. Little to begin with. Right. And that's the point that he's trying to make. So then he walks off because he says, you don't have a case, you don't have witnesses. It's not going to work. That's so it's not just so that women have less rights, because he's dead. He's dead. And there's going to be other witnesses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there are other witnesses that he's dead. Yes, but the fact that it's part of the way that the law would be understood. Just to make women that right. Work. That she's not. That that's that she's dead. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's just all part of the way that it it created the patriarchal society. Uh, in many ways, that's another whole discussion. I'm certainly, not <laughs> time for that. One. A few more the bells just ring. Oh my God. <laughs> so it's a little bit. Okay, and then he tells us what he's going to do. He's going to go now. He's going to go to the other side. He's going to argue with the other people. That will be in next week's episode. So we leave them. We go back to the camp, and then Philip has returned with the news that the baptizer has been arrested, taken into prison. Um, Mary comes back to the camp. There's that wonderful dialogue. You know, so you, you redeemed me, yes. you know, and, 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 I, and, I, and I broke it. And the Lord says, well, what kind of redemption could it be if you lost it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just can't live up to it. And he says, that's true. You can't live up to it. But don't try. I, I ask, is your heart, you've already given that to me. The rest will come in time. And then he says, just look at me. Look at me. And that's when he says, I forgive you. It's over. It's okay. So then it goes on. And then we go outside and they're talking about John. So they realize that because many of these were disciples of John, that they signed the decree in blood, which means John will never be let out of prison. And of course, we know that he won't be away. And so then the Lord makes the comment. Then Thomas comes in to tell them they don't have any more food. They're, they're at the end of that. So he says, well, in the morning we leave because it's Sabbath, and they're going to go to the, to the synagogue. And as they're walking, the Lord says to them, don't you realize that, do you feel like we are more and more misunderstood wherever we go? Maybe it's with Mary leaving, maybe it's in coming back and now John's arrest. I'm feeling nostalgic for a small town. So they're heading to the Wadi cult. Excuse me. Where we come across Elam, who has the video. Um, and um, where he, he goes up and he touches him and he heals him and um, they, they um, the, the Lord asks him, you know, what is wrong with him? And you know, he heals his hand. And the, the rabbi says, uh, only God can do that. And Jesus says, well, that's a very interesting point. <laughs> that only God has the right to do that. Why did you get that? Huh? <laughs> So then they go out, then they, they, the man is healed and they leave because they're thrown out of the synagogue. And then he realizes, well, wait a minute, I threw him up, but now I want to know what's going on here. So they chase him. That's where Peter starts to eat the grain. He realizes he forgot what the faith is. And that's when he says to the Levite, something greater than the temple is here. Don't you realize if David could eat the holy bread on the Sabbath because his men were hungry, 
And God allowed that. Something greater than the temple is here. And you would not have condemned the guiltless. And so he refers to himself then as the son of man. And of course, that's what's going to create the controversy, ultimately, that will cause him to be condemned by the same eagerness because the son of man is the prophecy. And so the Levi understands. He comes back, well, what does this mean? Here we are with the one I could count which is where the battle of David and Goliath was, was fought. Then that's his reference to David and Goliath. So maybe we are the little unknown insignificant place in which the, the, this, this will be able to, to show the, the hand of God. So we'll see from there where it goes. Okay. Awesome. That was yeah. awesome. Awesome explanation. Yeah. 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 So much more out of the yeah. watching it along. Yeah. Well, because because there's so much, there are so many levels that they in, incorporate into their understanding okay. of the scriptures. You got to be able to know what, what the scriptures are about. And all of this, this is really great Catholic reference that um, a lot of the Protestants and evangelicals stuff they understand it simply as historical, but for us, it's it's Eucharistic theology. Thank you, Pastor. You're very, very welcome. We got two to go. Next week, the week after. Hopefully.